Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, thank you for joining us on this live event with Playba Foundation. My name is Rami Ansoor, and I'm joined by a, a host of, of people who are here to celebrate the legacy of Brother Mustafa. Brother Abdullah Mustafa is somebody who was very dear to us, and he passed away this past November in 2022. And we, a number of people who are connected to him in various ways, decided to come together to do something to honor his legacy and his specifically to the, his connection to the Quran. And so we're going to be speaking today a little bit about Brother Mustafa and what he, what we know about him, his connection to us. And we, mashallah, have a number of people who have, have a connection to him, either direct or indirect, and want to honor his legacy. And also talk about a project that we have to honor him through providing Quran and Quranic resources to Muslims in prison in his name because of his connection to the Quran. So joining us today, we will have a dear friend of his, uh, Hajj Sajjad Shakur, who has known him for many, many years and who I actually met Mustafa through Sajjad. He will be sharing about um, some about his life and who he was and his connection to the Quran and his character and what he what he did um, on this uh, earth and how he impacted people. We also have Molana Kothar, who was a chaplain in the California Department of Corrections and knew most, uh, most of Brother Mustafa before, while he was incarcerated, as well as once he was free. We have Dr. Ahmed Shah joining us from Egypt, from the AUC. He's a professor at the American University of Cairo, and he's going to be speaking a bit about the Quran Be Held Project and how we're collaborating with, uh, well, how they're collaborating with Leiba to distribute the, that new translation of Sheikh Nuh Keller into the prisons. Uh, also, Sayyid Tayba from the Quran Be Held Project to, to, to speak a little bit more about that project. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and begin sharing a little bit about my connection to Mustafa, uh, Rahimahullah. And really, the, the next speaker, uh, Hajj Sajjad, has a much more a closer connection with Mustafa and is going to be able to give you, the listeners, the viewers, more about his life. But I'll just share with you what I know about uh, Mustafa. So years ago, maybe 2012, 2013, 2014, I started hearing brothers who were in prison, who had met him at certain times. And everybody said the same thing, that his character was amazing, that he had amazing character. He was an amazing leader. Uh, he was an amazing teacher. He was a worshiper of Allah. He was known for his worship, all of these things. He was a student for Tayyip, with, with us at Tayyip by correspondence, but I didn't have personal interaction with him while he was incarcerated, other than seeing some of his correspondence with our, with, with our team, some of his written correspondence. When he, when he was released in late 2020, December 2020, I was honored when Hajj Sajjad and uh, Mustafa uh, came to the Tayyip office to visit us here. And it was really a blessing for me to have that honor that his first day out of prison after many, many years, over, over 15 or I believe 20, Hajj Sajjad will share with us the exact number, he was, he, was, he was freed and he was incarcerated unjustly. He was actually innocent of the crime that he was accused for and that he was incarcerated for. And the last couple of years of his incarceration was during COVID. And what happens in the prison is that a lot of the free movement into the yards um, to be able to make phone calls, to take showers, to, to go to programs, that was all stops during COVID for a lot of prisons. And they were on permanent lockdown. So what that means is that you're in your cell for, for sometimes days at a time, which is essentially solitary confinement. So not only did he have this long-term incarceration, the last few years of the incarceration because of COVID, were essentially solitary confinement. And so realizing that, I said, I asked him, I said, how does it feel to now be free from the prison? And he said, he said, I feel like Musa alayhi salam and the children of Israel, Bani Israel must have felt when they left the land of the Pharaoh during that unjust, literally that unjust incarceration that they experienced. So that's what um, he shared with us at that time. And he said that he used to make a dua constantly Oh Allah, free me from this prison, just like you freed Musa and the Bani Israel from the clutches of the oppressive uh, Fir'aun, from the, from the Pharaoh. 
Over time, um, through the connection with uh, Hajj Sajj uh, Sajjad, Brother Mustafa was able to be a manager of a halal fast food place. And he could talk about that a little bit more, the falafel corner. And it was actually located at the first floor of the building where our our Taiba office in Union City is. So I got to see Mustafa a lot more. See him when we would go there. I go there every Friday with my son after Jum'a ah for burgers after Jum'a. Ah. And he, he knew our order. He knew our regular order. And one thing I noticed about Mustafa is he was always smiling, always smiling. And, you know, I didn't really think about it at the time much other than just noticing you never, no matter what pressure he was under, he was always smiling, had a cheerful demeanor, a cheerful attitude, welcomed you so great. But later on, once I realized his connection to the Quran, I knew where that was from. When you fill your soul with the, with the beauty of the Quran, you can only pour out beauty that comes out. Like they say, every container is only able to pour out what is in it. And so he filled his container with the Quran. Wallah al I used to go down, when I would go to that office, to, to, to the falafel corner, I would always see a Quran open. And I didn't question it that much at the time, but I thought to myself, well, who's reading Quran during this fast paced, fast food, like during the day, when, when are you getting time? Whoever's Quran that is, when are you getting time? Because there was a number of Muslims who were working there uh, in the kitchen behind the register and so forth. So I didn't know whose Quran it was. But later on, once I learned from Had Sajjad and others of Mustafa's connection, this deep connection to the Quran, I realized that was Mustafa's Quran. He always had it open. He was always reading it. And that impacts me now that if he, in holding down sometimes two and three jobs, he would be coming from a job, going to a job to manage this restaurant and to work in the restaurant, the fast food restaurant. And yet he would have the Quran there and he's reading it. And I could see it at different pages at different times. So I know he's not just checking a reference once in a while. He has a consistent a consistent habit where he has this connection to the Quran. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless me with just a portion of that connection that Mustafa rahimahullah had with the Quran. And I'll share two stories. One is one time he was uh, at, at Jum'ah, we, uh, we were sitting out after the masjid and we were talking about teaching in the prison. And I said, there was a sheikh who, when he heard that I was teaching in the prison, that, that sheikh said, tell Rami to be gentle with the prisoners to be gentle with the prisoners. And at the time I thought to myself, well, you know, you know, with all due respect to that sheikh, he's not from the United States. Maybe he doesn't understand the dynamics of the prisons. The brothers inside, they're really, you know, they're hardcore. I mean, these are people who are ready to, to defend themselves if a riot happens, if a war is declared and, and, and a mass melee riot, riot occurs. Like these are hardcore brothers. And I said, you know, the gentleness, uh, I don't think it's as important as the sheikh, but out of adab, I said, okay, mashallah. Later on is when I realized, no, there, that gentleness has to, ha has to happen. And it's because there's, uh, and so I shared this with Mustafa. I said, you know, even un underneath a lot of that, that, that hardness, that shell that's a protective factor, especially in the prisons, there's a, there's, there's a gentleness that's needed. So he shared with me a story. He said one time Mustafa, he was teaching. And later on, I found that he was a prolific teacher within the prison. When we were at the masjid for his janazah in, in Oakland, which, wallah al it looked like Jum'ah. It was on a Thursday, <clears throat> excuse me, but it looked like Jum'ah. That's how many people were there packed at the masjid. And they had an open mic for people to share their stories. And every person was given two or three minutes uh, Amir Sundiata had to, the Imam of the Masjid there, had to cut it off after one hour because so many people had so many things to share. There was a brother who said, I took my Shahada with Mustafa. He taught me the alphabet. He taught me Fatiha. He taught me the prayer. And then he put me forward to lead the prayer. Look at that, how he creates Imams, how he brings people into the fold. And just person after person was sharing how much they were touched by him. And so, um, um, when uh, Mustafa was teaching the story that he was sharing with me, he said that he called a brother up to write something on the board. And the brother, he said, wa was, uh, was very, very hesitant, but Mustafa encouraged him. He said, come on up. And then the, the brother was started crying. And I asked Mustafa, I said, you know, this brother that, that, that started crying at the board, at the chalkboard, I said, this is a brother who's, who's not going to back down if a riot occurs and his life or the life of others are in danger. And Mustafa, Mustafa said, by all means, he, was not, he did not back down. He was a rider. 
he was ready to defend himself and defend others from the oppression of the prison politics. And so for this man to cry at the board, Mustafa said he, 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 he in speaking to him at the time and being gentle with him, he found out that this, this person as a child, when he was in the third grade, he used to get made fun of by the teacher and the students for what he didn't know and was not able to write on the board. So when Mustafa called him up to the board, it triggered for him that, and he just broke down in tears. And so Mustafa shared with me that story when I said the advice of the Sheikh about be gentle with the prisoners when you're teaching them. And Mustafa said, by all means, that's what you have to do. And I know that he was gentle with people because every person that stood up to speak at that masjid, they, you could feel the connection with them. And I remember when I was leaving the masjid in Lighthouse, Oakland to go to the, to the cemetery, and I'll end on this. I had this, I had this feeling. I said, Mustafa is a Sheikh. He is a sheikh. From what I saw from the people and how he affected them and impacted them and his connection to the deen and his connection to the Quran, he is a sheikh in, in all sense of the, 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 the meanings. He is a sheikh of, of teaching, of ta'aleem. He is a sheikh of tarbiyah, of bringing people up and empowering people like the person who went from his shahada to leading prayers and others who shared with me uh, how they were impacted by, by Mustafa. He is a sheikh. And then I told myself, I said, he doesn't need me to give him that title. He was living the life of a sheikh and nobody knew that. Nobody even referred to him as Sheikh Mustafa. But for all intents and purposes, he was a sheikh in the truest sense of the meaning. And may Allah bless us. You know, when I heard that he was in his, in his coma, he was in a coma for about two weeks and then he was going to pass away. And I thought to myself, he has not even been out of prison for two years. He hasn't been able to travel because of the parole restrictions. He hasn't been able to make Hajj. You know, we want, he, he worked for us at Thay before a time and he was grading papers. And it's even hard for me. I, I can't get myself to remove his name, his email, his Slack from our, our team. I'm, I can't do it because he was a part, he was a student of ours, he was a community member, he helped build up Leva, he helped build up the Project Fatima, which was, which is our, our project to give extra care and consideration to the Muslim sisters and in, incarcerated and the families of those who are incarcerated. And so he's, he's really a dear person to us, but I feel that he was, he didn't get, that's my feeling, he said he didn't get a chance to, to, to travel and to, to, to more people to know him, but subhanAllah, at his janazah, everybody was. So many people were there. There were so many. Um, there were so many um, uh, people who were who were sharing things. Uh, Sundiata was saying they were getting condolences from all over the world. And I said, it's as if Allah took Mustafa out of the prison for just a short period, and let him be connected to so many people, literally around the world. And and then he brought him back to to him. He he collapsed after Fajr prayer. Uh, just a few a few feet feet from his sajada, and his mushaf was still open. That was his connection to the prayer. That his last action was his mushaf is open. He's reading. He gets up to do something, and he passes away. So this this program that we're we're doing is to commemorate that, and we're also raising funds to provide uh, Quranic resources to Muslims in prison in his name as a sadaqa jariya, as an ongoing charity uh, for Mustafa in his name. Here with us today is Haji Sajjad Shakur, who is a dear friend of Brother Mustafa and a friend of mine. And I've known him for many, many years. I met him, the first time I met him was in 2004 in my first visit to a prison. He actually made a wonderful dish, uh, a prison spread, like they say. And um, uh, there's so many things that I could say about him since he got out. He took his entrepreneurial spirit and has developed a franchise of halal, halal fast food chain here in the Bay Area that's well known and been given awards called the um, uh, Falafel Corner. And he also has a lot of experience in education, both teaching and studying while incarcerated, previous to incarceration, while incarcerated, and also post-incarceration in his master's studies program, and also his work on a PhD, uh, all centering around education as it relates to the incarcerated. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Haji Sajjad Shakur to share about the life of um, um, Abdullah Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Jazakallah for your words, Sheikh. Um, just a just a little quick uh, introduction about myself. My name is Sajad Shakur, and as Sheikh said, um, I'm the owner of the Falafel Corner. Um, 
we have a bunch of franchises now, alhamdulillah. It's one of the biggest franchises in, in America, actually, as far as uh, halal is concerned. Um, the way I got to know Mustafa was we were cellmates in San Quentin. I myself was um, in prison for just a little over two decades, and Mustafa was in prison for about a total of, of 26 years. Um, <clears throat> Mashallah, you know, one thing they say about cellmates is that just like out here, if you want to know the true person, um, you ask his wife or his kids because they'll tell you the truth. They see the person for who he is. Same thing with a cellmate in prison. Um, you're with the guy most of the time, so you know more about him than anybody else. And alhamdulillah, the stories that I'll relate to you about who Mustafa was um are just amazing and because he, he was an amazing human being and if i was to sum up mustafa's life i would sum it up in the words that Mulana koser told me um after mustafa had passed away um uh, Mulana koser summed it up beautifully he said that we all prepare to meet allah but i don't think anyone prepared as much as mustafa so inshallah i just want to tell a little bit about what his schedule was like. Every morning, um, Mustafa would wake up for the Hajjad. He never, all the years that we were cellies, and everyone else that, that was a celly prior to that, and even when he got out of prison, um, there was one thing that was central to Mustafa's daily routine, which was he always woke up for the Hajjad. He never missed the Hajjad. And in fact, Alhamdulillah, he... Um, this was a few months before he passed away. He was actually telling me about that. He says, man, alhamdulillah, I've now missed the hajjad in 28 years. And he would, so he would wake up for the hajjad. Then he had um, a routine of dhikr that he would do until fajr. He would read his fajr uh, prayer, and then he would uh, read his Quran. So this was his everyday uh, routine while we were cellmates um up until uh they opened up the door for us to go to chow he would be sitting there reading his quran and sheikh that's the same quran that you saw at falafel corner that was the quran that he had in prison he had two qurans one that he kept with him at all times that's the one that you saw in fact um i don't know if you noticed it or not but the covers, because in prison, they don't allow you to have hardcover books, so they removed the inner lining. So all it had was the exterior cover. The inner lining was removed. And um, I have that Quran now, alhamdulillah. But he had another Quran that he was keeping at home. One Quran he kept at, at Falafel Corner. The other Quran he kept at his house. So anyway, this was his daily routine every morning. Um, one of the most beautiful human beings, one of the most generous and devout human beings you'll ever meet. Um, uh, just a testament to his generosity, for example, is when Sheikh Tamim was opening up um, his Masjid, Masjid al-Huda, and they had their first fundraiser. Um, I remember letting Mustafa know that, hey, you know, Sheikh Tamim, they're opening up a Masjid, they're having a fundraiser. Mustafa donated his monthly check. In prison, um, you get about 34, 40, 50 cents an hour and accumulates to about 80 or 90 dollars a month with which you can buy, you know, cosmetics and coffee or whatever from their commissary. He donated his whole check to the mustard. And in fact, by doing so, other people that were in the prison donated their checks too. For the prison so this is just um a, a glimpse into the kind of um generosity that mustafa had and as far as his devoutness i mean this man was one of the most devout people i've ever met and just to give you a glimpse of that um i got out a few years before he did and I used to always tell him about this Badmash burger that we have at our store. And he hadn't had, you know, halal bacon in 26 years. So he was like, man, when I get out, 
I want you to pick me up. I want you to give me one, bring one of those Badmash burgers with you. So that's what I did. He, when he paroled from San Quentin, I went, I went to San Quentin. I picked him up, and I had the burger and fries and soda and everything. And he said, "Listen, um, before I touch any of this, I want to go to Masjid Al Huda. I want to make my salat, and then I want to meet Sheikh Damim, and I want to meet." Uh, Sheikh Rami, and then afterwards, inshallah, Ali. So imagine 26 years you haven't had a halal burger, and you know all about it because I've been telling you about it. And for 26 years, you've been, you know, you haven't had this kind of halal food, and then you get a chance to eat it. And like, I'll eat it, but after I meet the shayukh and after I make my two rakats, of greeting the masjid, that's first. And to give you a better understanding of why that was so profound is we didn't have halal meat in prison. The reason why we, at the end of his uh, time in prison, we were allowed to have halal meat in prison is he did the lawsuit. It was Mustafa who did the lawsuit to allow Muslim prisoners to have access to Juma prayer, to have access to... Um, uh, prayer rugs and uh, all the other Islamic artifacts and halal meat. So for 17 years prior to winning that lawsuit, it might have been 18 years, but around that time, 17, 18 years prior to winning that lawsuit, Mustafa ate beans and rice along with a lot of us, ate beans and rice every day. So just imagine after all these years of eating beans and rice, you finally have this big giant badmash burger, and you're like, I'll wait until I'll meet the shayukh and I'll make my salat. That is a level of uh, devoutness that is unseen. And, you know, when he got out, I I told him, I said, just work with me at this falafel corner, and inshallah, whenever, whenever I have the the ability to get you your own, inshallah, I will. He was with me for almost two years from the day he got out. Till he passed away, he was with me working at Falafel Corner, learning the trade, learning everything about it. And then, mashallah, we got the opportunity for him to open up his own store in Oakland, not too far from his house. And that day, um, I called him up in the morning, and it was right after Fajr. And our agreement was the night before that um, I'm going to come to the Bay Area to pick up all the equipment for your restaurant me and my construction guys we're coming to pick up all the equipment i'm going to call you uh, as soon as i hit the freeway and i'll let you know when i'm close and you meet us there and all all of us will be you know able to put all the equipment in the trucks and we'll get it done in a matter of you know six seven hours um so i hit the freeway it was right after fudger i hit the freeway i called him he's not picking up and I said, oh, maybe he's, you know, doing his thing. You know, he's he's uh, still in Salat or doing his zikr or reading Quran. About a half hour later, I call him again. He still didn't pick up. I called him several other times on the freeway. He never picked up. I get to the Bay Area, pick up uh, me and the construction guy. We're lo we had two trucks. We're loading up all the equipment. Called him several times. He still never picked up again. Around 6 or 7 o'clock at night. I'm um, starting to get worried because he's not answering and no text messages or anything. So I called his roommate, Dawood, and I asked Dawood. Um, he said, Dawood said, look, we made Fajr together. Then I went to work and he was doing this thing. And by doing this thing, he means he was sitting on the musalla reading Quran. And that's what he did every day after Fajr. That's what he did when we were cellies in San Quentin. That's what he did ever since he's been out. Um so I said, well, you know, he's not answering. Can you check up on him? And he said, look, they got me doing a double shift today. I don't get off till 11 o'clock at night. When I get off uh -oh, and I go home, I'll let you know what's going on. So we didn't finish till like 11 something at night anyway, unloading all the equipment because it was just two of us. So by the time we finished unloading all the equipment, I get a call from Dawood saying that, look, I got home and... Uh, the front door is open. The front door to the house is open. Now, this is East Oakland, man. You don't leave the door open at 11 o'clock at night. And and he said, man, I'm kind of scared now because the front door is open. But he goes inside, goes upstairs to Mustafa's room, 
And he's like, man, Mustafa's room is open. His door is open. His musalla is still, the prayer mat is still in the same place it was this morning. The Quran is right there on the prayer mat. It's open and it's exactly where it was when I left. His his phone is there and his 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 wallet and everything is there and dicker beads are right there, but Mustafa's not there. So he's like, Look, in the morning I'm gonna make some phone calls and see what's going on. Well the next day we found out that he was in the hospital and he had a heart attack and he was in a coma. And I mean the way he left us was profound as well. I mean, Allah just took him very quick. He was just, he was gone. He was there one day and then he was completely gone. But he left doing the thing that he loved the most. He loved sitting there on that musalla reading the Quran after Fajr. That was his most peaceful and beautiful time to such an extent that when we were sellies, I couldn't wake up for the Hajj because I'd be up really late doing the homework. I was taking college courses, so I'd be up really late doing the homework. And he didn't want me, he didn't want to disturb me in the morning. And this is a small cell. It's a five foot by eight foot cell. So any little bit of noise gets amplified in that little cell. So he would wake up early for the Hajj. And instead of turning on the faucet to make wudu, he would use a water bottle. And he would fill up the water bottle at night and in the morning be really, really quiet and make his wudu, do his salat, do his dhikr, and then wake me up for fajr. I mean, this is what he loved to do. And in the middle of the night, the whole world is asleep and he's alone with Allah doing his dhikr and reading his Quran. That was his favorite thing. And that's how he died too. He died doing that. So, I just wanted to share uh, that, what I witnessed about Brother Mustafa, what I witnessed about the love that he had for Allah's book, and the love that he had for Allah's people. I mean, this man, while he was in prison, um, so many people converted to Islam because of Mustafa. So many people were taught Islam in prison because of Mustafa. And every single Muslim in California prison that goes to Jummah every Friday goes because Mustafa filed a lawsuit and Mustafa was able to make that possible. So, Alhamdulillah, that's, um, that's what I have to say about Mustafa. He was a beloved brother. He will be missed very much. And anything that I can do to be part of anything that has um, something to do with his legacy or promoting something that he had a profound love for. Um, and alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm all for it. So, alhamdulillah. Well, thank you so much, um, Hajj Sajjad, for, for sharing that. Um, you knew him better than most people that knew him. And even those people who were at a distance, they felt that spirituality, that, that beautiful character that ha that he had, that connection. And um, I know that because of that closeness that you had to him, you saw that so much more and and so in his passing as well it was so much harder for you than it was for us it was hard for the whole community i mean people who who barely knew him were were really really um really affected by his passing um and subhanallah he's buried in the cemetery right next to another brother who's also a dear member of, of the community uh brother um brother musa and brother musa for those um um, of you in the Bay Area who know him, he was very active in the community, and Subhanallah, they they passed away in a in a short time of each other, and they're buried right next to each other. So when you go, you visit uh, Brother Musa, you'll see Mustafa right there. If you visit Mustafa, Musa is right there, and I believe there's a sign in that it's almost a, a meeting of the two oceans, and in the meeting of the two ocean, oceans at Majma al Bahrain, that's where the secrets are found. So in the lives of those two men uh, are are a lot that we can learn, um, and. So without further ado, we'd also like to, to share uh, one, of the, one of the programs that we're working through Taiba with a collaboration with the brothers behind the, the Quran Beheld Project, and they're here to share a little bit about it. Uh, Sayyid Tayyib, 
and also Dr. Ahmed Khan um, are going to share about the Quran Be Held project. This was a project uh, they'll, they'll share about how it was intended uh, in part, the distribution of it to get into the prisons in uh, in Mustafa's name, to distribute these prison the, the Qur'ans into the prisons in Mustafa's name. And so we'll have um, Sayyid uh, Tayyib, who is from Houston, Texas, a dear friend of mine. I've known him for about 10 years right now. Alhamdulillah, it's been a beautiful friendship. And I look forward to many more years of that friendship. And also we have Dr. Ahmed Khan, who's uh, very gracious with his time. It's past midnight in, in Cairo, where he is. He's a professor at AUC, the American University of Cairo, and um, there's much more that I can say about him, but if you just um, look up his bio online, he has a number of uh, areas of research. He has a book called Heresy and the Formation of Medieval Islamic Orthodoxy, the Making of Sunnism from the 8th to 11th centuries. Um, he has some articles which are going to be appearing in Arabic as well, a lot more, and um, so I encourage uh, the viewers to, to, to read more and learn more about his works, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sayyid um, Tayyib uh, to, to share about the Quran Behel project, how it how it came to be, and the collaboration with Tayyib and some of the behind the scenes um, information. Jazakallah khair and salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Bismillah, salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Jazakallah khair and Sheikh Rami and uh, Sidi Sajjad for those really inspiring words. This is uh, this was new to me as well in terms of the life of Sidi Mustafa. I knew he was an extremely special person. Um, but you've just elucidated on that, and it's really uh, just humbling to be involved in this project. And so I don't want to take too much time of our listeners and, and others uh, who are obviously fasting today as well. But I wanted to just say a few words in terms of how this initiative came about and how it's connected to the wonderful, excellent work that Taiba has been doing. And I've been intimately involved with Taiba as Sheikh Rami. I consider myself a, a bad student, someone that I've you know known for 10 years, as Sheikh Rami said, and just been really touched by his work with the curriculum and, and the things that you've done uh, for the prisoners. And so I feel like my worlds have you know, converged in a sense uh, with this Quran Beheld project. I was aware um, that the, you know, Sheikh Noor was coming to the end of completing this work after almost 17 years of effort, uh, going through this with Talaqi, i.e. one-on-one -on -one education with his teacher, Sheikh Ali Haini. And when the work was coming to a conclusion by around 2020, and it was in the review stages, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Ahmed Khan, and, and many other brothers, some here in Houston as well, we were involved in kind of seeing it through to fruition. And so uh, many trips to Turkey for the publishing and so on and so forth. Once it was finally produced, I was just in awe of the kind of caliber, what, what had gone into that work. Um, I've read many translations in my life. I'm sure many of you all have. But this one really hit me. Um, and you could see that it was done by a traditional alim. Um, and, and the words, you know, for many of us and, and those who just don't have the ability to get to the Arabic, and it's a very difficult language to penetrate, this is the best that I think we could do. And so I wanted to get that out as a passion of mine, um, just to spread that word here in America, certainly, and for the Western speaking Muslims, and to be involved in that. And so one of the first people I reached out to, and we met actually, Sheikh Noor Keller had, had asked us to go and give it to some of the ulama, the early releases of the Quran Beheld. And one of the people that came to mind was uh, Sheikh Rami. And so we, we sat with him. Uh, Dr. Ahmed was with me. It's the first time that he was meeting uh, Sheikh Rami. And we were just, again, so impressed by the curriculum that has been built on the Farad Ain, on the Ahnaf, the Hanafi school, the Maliki, all the different schools of thought and everything. That many of these prisoners um, that you know, have come out are basically far more advanced in their ilm than the majority of us who are free outside. Uh, we just, you know, though we have the ability to go and study, we don't take on that time. And we don't use it in the right way. Whereas those prisoners, they actually take their deen so seriously. And Sheikh Rami has facilitated that. So I saw an opportunity for the Quran as a way to plug in to what they're already doing. Um, but I wasn't aware of how we could actually get this you know, spread uh, through Tabor. It was just a, a thought in my mind at the time. Lo and behold, if we listen to the story of Sidi Sajjad that he said so inspiringly, um, you know, Sidi Mustafa passed away a short time thereafter, after I visited Sheikh Rami. And... Sheikh Noor, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this at the time, but Sheikh Noor, um, he was a student of his while he was in prison. And I have heard Sheikh Noor many times say things like, you know, there are people in prison who are closer to me and they follow, you know, the irshad and the things that are being, you know, propounded and, and discussed in, in the deen than those even sometimes sitting next door to me. And I was always the wonder who these people are. Um, and clearly to me now, it was Sidi Mustafa he was referring to and, and others like him. And so when he passed away, Sheikh Noor had decided 
to initiate the Quran donation project that Sheikh Rami just discussed um, to get the Quran beheld into prisons. And Alhamdulillah, we were fortunate enough to initiate this project at the tail end of last year. And it's basically gone, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, it's done very well. There's a lot of people who donate regularly as a way of sadaqah. And through that donation scheme, um, with some brothers here in Houston as well, that we're closely affiliated with, we are now matching the donations and spreading it out through Tabor Foundation's Quran Initiation Project with under Sidi Mustafa's name. And, and the way I just really see it is that, you know, I've seen Sheikh Nu's love of the Quran firsthand. Uh, there's no way he could have produced a work like this without real love for, that, for, for the Quran. And the way that he reads it intensely, just like he was, we were described about Sidi Mustafa, um, but it's just, for me, amazing. It's Qadr Allah in the way that it's connected now. And the project is named after Sidi Mustafa, who clearly loved the Quran. It was his go-to guide. It was the way that, you know, he did everything in his life, referred back to the divine writ of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's just an honor. Uh, and I just wanted to thank everyone for, for uh, you know, participating and helping us in this initiative. Um, please do look it up online on QuranBehold.com and also for Tabor Foundation and the great work they're doing. And so, uh, Dr. Ahmed, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to you, inshallah, for a few words about the Quran Behold. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just want to thank uh, everybody, especially Sheikh Rami and uh, Sa Sajjad, for sharing these uh, beautiful, um, beautiful stories about Sidi Mustafa. Like Tayyib, uh, I did not know him uh, personally. But it's clear to me that, uh, especially on this special night, um, how the legacy of Sidi Mustafa is really cannot be uh, separated from the impact that the Quran has on millions and millions all over the world. Uh, and from what we ha we've heard from Sheikh Rami uh, and others, and we'll hear more about um, Sidi Mustafa, it's very clear that uh, Sidi Musfa sets uh, an example for us all in terms of what kind of connection uh, people ought to have with this divine book. I want to thank uh, Sheikh Rami and the entire team at Taiba for putting together this very special conversation. Um, I just want to say a few words about the Quran beheld from a you know, as, a, as an academic, I work in the field of Quranic studies and tafsir. And I've been teaching um, courses on the Quran, on Quranic exegesis. And in the course of that teaching, I realized that um, the existing English translations of the Quran that we have, um, that there's something sorely missing in the translations and in their approach to the text. I think the main issue was that translators have approached the Quranic text in a way that is quite different to the way in which traditional ulama and mufassirin, interpreters of the Quran, uh, would understand and interpret the text. In many cases, uh, we have translations of the Quran that simply ignore and neglect um, what the scholars of tafsir have said about every single word and every single verse of the Quran. Now, during this process of teaching, um, I learned about Sheikh Nuhamim Keller's translation of the Quran, and it quickly became apparent to me that this was a landmark moment in the history of English translations of the Quran. For a number of reasons, uh, I'll just mention a few of them, but the first is that the translation is based on an exhaustive reading of over 20 major works of Quranic exegesis. So it places tafsir at the very forefront of Quran translation. And secondly, um, every single word and verse was read not only through the works of tafsir, but Sheikh Nu discussed them for over 20 years, not once, but twice with a living traditional master of the Quranic and Arabic sciences. And this is quite important. Um, and it's related to the point that um, uh, Ustaz Sajjad mentioned as well, that um, this idea of being connected to the traditional ulama and what they have uh, articulated about the religion is really essential. And it's essential to the work that the uh, Taiba Foundation 
is, is seeking to do. Uh, thirdly, Sheikh Nu's translation is the first translation to pay attention to the science of Balagha. Balagha is one of the most important and difficult sciences of the Quran, and it's concerned with the science of rhetoric and meaning. And so Balagha, you know, Balagha traditionally was seen to be the very basis for the miraculous nature of the Quran, its inimit uh, inimitability. Um, and so most of these translations overlook Balagha, and the Quran beheld is one of the few translations, I would say perhaps the only translation that encapsulates as, as fully as possible uh, Balagha into its translation. And fourthly, the, the English style of the Quran beheld, it's, it's smooth, it's elegant, and it's alive. You know, it very much brings the, um, the Quranic text uh, to life uh, in a way that we saw, um, you know, in the descriptions that were given by Sheikh Rami and Ustaz Sajjad, the way in which the Quran was very much alive in Sidi Mustafa's life. And I just want to read uh, one example um, from Quran Surah 49, uh, verse 12. Um, I'll just read a couple of verses in the English translation. O you who believe, shun much of suspicion. Verily, some suspicion is heinous sin. Nor pry into the private matters of others, nor speak any of you ill of another behind his back. Would any of you love to eat the flesh of his own brother when dead? You would loathe it and fear Allah. Verily, Allah is oft relenting, all compassionate. O mankind, verily we created you of a single male and female and but made you peoples and major tribes to know and appreciate your own kindred ties with each other. Verily, the greatest of you all in the sight of Allah is the most God-fearing of you. Verily, Allah is all-knowing, all-aware. So I just wanted to share those verses with you. These are the verses when I opened the Quran earlier today, and these are the verses that kind of stuck, uh, struck me when thinking about um, Sidi Mustafa and uh, the impact that he, he left, and, and really the, the, the lesson that his life has for all of us that the greatest of you all in the sight of Allah is the most God-fearing of you. And so just to finish, I'll say that I think that the Quran Beheld provides readers with access to a readable, reliable, accurate, and orthodox translation of the Quran. And I think this corresponds precisely to the incredible mission and work of Taiba Foundation, which is to make reliable and important Islamic literature available to incarcerated Muslims. And I think this is also something to bear in mind that um, this initiative, which again, uh, Sheikh Nu had uh, brought to the attention of Tayyib and that um, is now in collaboration with Tayyiba Foundation. Um, I think it's brought us all to think very deeply and very carefully about the importance of doing whatever we can to facilitate Islamic literacy education, particularly around the Quran, to Muslims everywhere. And it's very important that we don't forget those um, whose, whose situation is, is very different uh, to ours uh, today. And we're also very pleased that uh, this initiative has resulted in other publishers, Muslim publishers now also um, sponsoring similar programs. And so this is one of the great, again, this is one of the great uh, uh, legacies of Sidi Mustafa that this project now has actually resulted in, in other Muslim publishers now trying to ensure that access to the Quran and Islamic material is made available to our Muslim brothers and sisters in North America. And Jazakumullah uh, Khair, and I pass it over now to Sheikh Rami. 
Well, Iyakram, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for sharing that and for sharing insight into the project about the Quran beheld. And for the for the viewers, one of the things that really um, affected me was there was a there was a a donor of Tayyib, a longtime donor of Tayyib, and he wants to say anonymous, and so we're definitely going to protect that amana, an, amana, that trust. And so he reached out to me and he said he wanted to help distribute the Qur'an be held to the prisons in the name of, of, of Mustafa, rahimahullah. And that the Qur'an be held was also having a simultaneous project. You can find it online where we where you where purchasers of the book can also purchase an extra book to be delivered into the prison. And now to date, they have, I believe, over 500 donated copies that are going into the prisons. And we're working with the uh, with Sayyid Tayyib and his team um, to to get those those copies into the prison. And this other donor wants to match those. And he wants to send in literally thousands of copies and match every copy that's that's purchased. And so that's one that's one of the project as Dr. Ahmed was saying that that this project around the Quran and it and the connection to Mustafa then got other people to think because then we at Tayba we started thinking, you know, we can we can expand this. We can make more, you know, all of the various Quran resources that are available over the years that various uh, organizations have have shared with us. Like, say, for example, there's an organization called Measured Tones, uh, Qadi Ashir. If you can read about his story, and he does work in the prisoners as well, prison as well with Muslim Prisoner Project. He donated uh, some of his classes on Tajweed, and we're facilitating that into the prison, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Rashad, who has a number of translations of Imam Sabuni's, uh, Sheikh Sabuni's uh, tafsir of the Quran, he's donated a number of the, of the copies of the Quran, but it's never been galvanized into one project. And so with the, the sincerity of that one donor who approached Quran Beheld and said, I want to facilitate this into the prisons and, and the, the idea of the, the Quran Beheld project to get it into the prison, then we started thinking, let's let's bring all these together and do this in the name of, of Mustafa. And so that's what we have the 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 launch good uh, project that's for also we're we're it's going to happen whether or not we hit the goal uh, with our launch good we're going to go forward with this in the name of uh, of Mustafa um, and so I encourage you to check out that uh, that fundraising project I encourage you to look at um, the the wonderful website of the Quran be held learn more about that um, and also um, learn more about how you can you you can get involved in any of these many amazing projects without further ado and i know we had some te technical difficulties so we have a little bit of a delay but i'm going to turn it over to molana kothar who's a who uh, who's a scholar and in addition to a scholar he has extensive experience working in the prisons he was a chaplain in the california department of Ke correction cdcr for over 10 years and it was through that experience in the cdcr that he met brother mustafa so we asked him and he mashallah graciously accepted the invitation to share uh, a little bit about the life of mustafa from what he knew um, from working with him directly and in person uh, during those years that he was a chaplain. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, turn it over to Molana Kothar. Assalamu alaikum. If you could just unmute your, unmute your mic. Uh. <coughs> Sorry about that. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wal aqibatul al-muttaqeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Musaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. عن انس رضي الله تعالى عن انه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ان لله اهلين من الناس قالوا يا رسول الله من هم قال هم اهل القران هم اهل الله وخاصته رواه احمد والنسائي وابن ماجه والحاكم في مستدركه respected uh, listeners alhamdulillah i'm immensely uh, honored to this be uh, to be a part of this um, for one uh, for the nature of the project itself and two, for, you know, to, to be part of the, uh, the memory of our beloved friend and uh, beloved companion, uh, Abdullahi Mustafa. May Allah have mercy upon his soul and grant us the highest ranks of the hereafter. Um, you know, there's, there's many things that could be said about uh, Sidi Mustafa. He was, he, was very, he was truly a unique individual. And I shared this, you know, afterwards, after his passing. It's very interesting that I was getting messages from like around the globe um, that there was somebody who wrote a small obituary, uh, you know, for Sidi Mustafa. And I guess it started 
you know, uh, being passed around amongst the, you know, the people of knowledge. So some of my mashayikh, uh, including uh, Sheikh Hashim, who's down in Southern California, he didn't know I had any relationship with Sidi Mustafa, but when he just heard about his life, and this is not all the accomplishments of his life or all that he had done in his life. This is what could be summarized in a small little post. When someone had forwarded it to him, he was so, you know, uh, so amazed by the, the, the story of this individual, he started forwarding it on to his students. So when he sent it to me, you know, it, it, it made me smile that subhanAllah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making the, 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 the mention of our brother, you know, worldwide. I, I've seen people from like around the globe, you know, making dua for him, you know, uh, uh, you know, inspiring others through him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of this effort as a sadaqa jariya for him uh, and the means of his continued elevation in the hereafter. Uh, there's much that can be said about Sidi Mustafa uh, in, in many, many different ways. I want to kind of stick with the theme of what we're discussing today. Uh, and this is the distribution of Qur'an and the proliferation of Qur'an amongst the Muslims and particularly those Muslims in the prison system, not only just the Muslims, uh, mankind in general. Uh, you know, in, in the prison you have this issue that, that is a, a common problem, is you have literature that floods the prison from all over. You know, you, you can walk in, I had a regular routine when I would go into the prison, I'd uh, go into the office and more often than not, Mustafa would be in the office reading his Qur'an uh, or doing some studies. And I would go in and I would just look at the bookshelf to see, you know, different people would sometimes come and put things in the bookshelf. And you would have, you know, uh, um, Qur'an translations. In fact, one of the most beautiful, elegant uh, looking copies of the Qur'an I ever saw. When I, uh, when I opened it up, I saw it was something that I was unfamiliar with. And I looked further into it and, you know, it was, uh, you know, spread by a group that doesn't believe in the finality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you have this issue where, you know, the, this, uh, the groups that, you know, uh, uh, that lack orthodoxy, to, uh, for, to touch on the point that was discussed uh, earlier, they're making so much effort within the prisons to proliferate teachings that are incorrect. But subhanAllah, it's organizations like Taiba and, and those like it, that alhamdulillah, they're still flag bearers of the correct uh, orthodoxy of Islam being spread in the prisons. And mashallah, Sidi Mustafa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was a, he was a example of the true way in which this deen can be spread. You know, I remember he used to always mention this, is more important than anything else is people want to see your demo. People want to see what you're demonstrating to the people. And wallahu alam, Allah knows best, but I feel why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him to be such a great da'i. And it made him such a means of so many people's guidance was he lived what he, what he preached. In fact, there's so much of what he would do that was secret. I, I, this always, you know, blows my mind. You know, there are certain things that you stumble across, you know, with regards to certain people. There are certain things that, you know, you, you, they, they keep secret and people find out. There's so many things that we're finding out about Sidi Mustafa. I can only imagine how many things remained a secret between him and Allah. But one thing that he had was this, is his example was an example worth emulating. His example was an example, you know, you know, worth wanting to become like. You hear about certain, you know, salihin and the people of the past. You know, people would just see them and they wouldn't need to ask for any proof. They wouldn't need to ask any other questions. They would see them and they would simply say that I want to be like this person. I don't know what he is. I don't know who he is, but I see him and whatever I see him possessing, I want that for myself. And I feel this was one of the secrets of Sidi Mustafa by which he was able to be a means of guidance of so many people. Whether it be giving them, you know, uh, you know the, uh, the shahada, give, giving them Islam, giving them Quran, giving them salat, whatever it was. I think one of the biggest secrets of, of why he was so effective was this. Is he lived everything that he taught. Rather he did it to a higher extent. And one of the things as has been mentioned by others... And, you know, th there's people here that are more worthy to kind of speak about Sidi Mustafa, alhamdulillah, or Sidi Sajjad, uh, you know, who lived with him, probably knows him more intimately than, than most people ever will. You know, he already spoke. We have people like Sidi Mikail also on this call, people that were extremely close to him and more deserving to speak. But uh, there are certain things that, alhamdulillah, I had a chance to see in Sidi Mustafa that I feel are, is a, of paramount importance for people to know because in it is, again, a demonstration of how do you get closer to Allah. It comes in a hadith of Ahmad Nasa'i, Ibn Majah, and the Mustadrak of Hakim. That Anas radiallahu anhu narrates the, the hadith that I mentioned earlier. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ أَهْلِينَ مِنَ النَّاسِ 
that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has from amongst mankind people that are his own special people. Indeed Allah has from amongst mankind certain people that are his own. So the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, who are they? Who are these people? Because they obviously they have that longing, they have that desire that I want to be able to get, you know, within that status of being Allah's close person. He replied, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hum ahlul Qur'an, hum ahlullahi wa khasatuhu. That they are the people of the Qur'an. They are the people that are the, the people of Allah and His special slaves. His special people. And brothers and sisters, I think this is one of the I think, secrets of Sidi Mustafa is he wanted to be Allah's special person. And anything and everything that he could do to try to get close to Allah, he tried to do it. Whether it be tahajjud, whether it be connecting with the ulama and the ahlullah, whether it be you know, going to the masajid. So many things can be said in every single aspect of his life. But from amongst those things was connecting to, to Allah through his book, through his word. And the, the, the effort he exerted in trying to get closer to Allah, I feel he is a prime example for people to see and understand how do you actually long to get closer to Allah. Recently, you know, I, I, it's Ramadan, we like to get motivated to do more good deeds and, and, and make more effort. Someone, may Allah uh, reward them, shared this small little post with me that I thought was very beneficial. That so much of the Qur'an is us just trying to establish a relationship with Allah through the Qur'an is the struggle and the effort that we put forth in trying to get closer to Allah through this book. And I used to see that in Sidi Mustafa. That, you know, he's not, he's not a person that was born into a Muslim family. Rather, he accepted Islam quite late in life. And, you know, at that point, you know, your, your, your tongue kind of becomes stuck in its ways. But with tremendous difficulty, with a tremendous effort, he would try to read the Qur'an with Tajweed. We would have halaqat of Tajweed. And with great effort, and he would make a lot of effort in trying to make his talafud, his, his pronunciation of every makhraj, of every uh, point of articulation correct. He would sit there and he would, he would try to have it longer, he would try to have it more. It wasn't enough that we would have our own you know, halaqa of Qur'an. He would sit and meet with other brothers and, and meet with them privately and, read, and go over the Qur'an as well. And it wasn't easy for him, it was quite difficult. And you can see the difficulty, but he would do it with great fervor, with great enthusiasm, and try to get closer to the, the, the Book of Allah through, through proper tajweed and proper, proper pronunciation. Along with that, he tried to learn Arabic. Alhamdulillah, I had the honor of trying to help him in learning his Arabic. You know, Sidi Mustafa was a person of tremendous, you know, humility. And whenever he saw an avenue by which he can get closer to Allah and try to, you know, build that, you know, tie with Allah is, is, is a means of getting closer to Allah, he would seek it out. And he would even come to people that were lesser than him and younger than him and smaller than him to learn from them if need be. So I considered him someone that I look up to and I make dua to Allah that Allah allow me to take from his example and emulate it as well. But he was also, you know, that wouldn't shy him away from learning from people that were much junior to him. And I remember he would come and try to learn, you know, Arabic grammar and morphology and all the sciences that you learn to try to understand the Qur'an. And this is something that maybe many people may not know about him, but having helped him in that process, he was a brother who had some form of dyslexia or some learning difficulties. It was not easy for him. It was extremely hard for him. And the reason I'm mentioning this, brothers and sisters, is a lot of times people throw in the towel when it comes to the Qur'an. It's not easy to learn how to read the Qur'an in Arabic. It's not easy to learn to, how to you know, learn Nahu and Sarf and these sciences. It's not easy to do these things. But the example that I saw that, it, that, in, that motivates me and inspires me from the example of Sidi Mustafa was how much effort and difficulty he would endure for the sake of getting closer to Allah. And that applied to the Qur'an as well. He would come and he, we, would, we would have the lessons in Arabic grammar and morphology and there would be a good amount of you know, memorization that would take place as well, vocabulary, this, that, and the other. And it would be hard for him, but he would do it. And I was not the first person he did it with. Before me, there were many others. But consistently, he would come. He would find a way to come. He would sit in the office privately. He wouldn't let me go. And I, I used to love that about him. He would try to do whatever he can to learn and, 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 and build himself in that relationship with Allah's book. And with great difficulty, with that you know, difficulty in learning, he covered the books. And I remember, you know, after he finished it, with great enthusiasm, even though maybe it was still difficult for him to actually study it, he ordered uh, Safat al-Tafasir of uh, Sheikh Sabuni, you know, a, a, a beginning textbook on the Tafsir of the Qur'an. He ordered it, and with great difficulty, whenever he would get time, he would try to read it. 
and try to understand it. He would pull out his dictionary. You know, that was the fervor he had. That was the enthusiasm he had. And I feel, you know, one of the greatest ways we can leave this as a son of Qajariya for him is this leaving this legacy of trying to connect people with the Qur'an. And it makes me extremely happy to hear how, you know, Taiba Foundation and the Qur'an Be Held Project has kind of worked together to try to, one, d- disseminate this translation of the Qur'an, you know, in a, in a place where it's sorely needed, to a group of people that will definitely appreciate it. You know, what, what connected me to, the, to prison work was, when I was, in, uh, when I was a student in college, there was a c- couple of chaplains that used to come and give the khutbahs at our local masjid. And I remember as a youngster, I always had, I, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and it, and, and it intrigued me how a person can go to a prison and transform their life and become you know, uh, uh, completely changed in that setting. So I always wanted to meet the Muslims in prison. So I, when I met this chaplain, I asked him, you know, can I, you know, can you please take me in? I just want to meet the brothers. So when he took me in, I remember my first experience there. It was at Folsom State Prison in Folsom, California. And I went in and when I had a chance to meet the Muslims, I was sharing with them certain things. And as I'm sharing with them, I'm realizing that these are bounties that every Muslim on the streets has open access to. But the people behind bars, they don't have access to it. But had they had access to it, they would have definitely appreciated and valued it. Simply going to the masjid and offering two rakat salat, praying behind the, the imam in the masjid, having access to whatever literature you, you want, it filled me with such appreciation. It filled me with such a re- realization of how many bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow upon us. It was one of the things that motivated me to actually go study and pursue, uh, you know, uh, uh, learning the Quran, learning Arabic, and learning those things that can hopefully draw us closer to Allah by His grace. And brothers and sisters, you know, the, the, this this project, I think this is one of the things that is, you know, that that is, uh, that needs to be mentioned as well. That the people that will be receiving these these uh, resources, be it the Quran, be it translation, be it some of the tafasir that Sheikh Rami had mentioned, these are people that will appreciate it, people like Sidi Mustafa, that will take it, that will appreciate it, and that will make it a means by which they draw closer to Allah. I'll end with this, that I remember one time, one person came to me, and he told me that, you know what, I was amazed, I was at one masjid, in you know some random place, and I ran into this, and to this brother, I happened to be, you know, at the masjid, and I heard him reciting Quran, and his tajweed was immaculate. His tajweed was, was, it was immaculate. It was the type of tajweed that, you know, a, a teacher would have, you know, that, that would be teaching students. So I had to go up to him and just ask him, like, you know, who he was, you know, where did he study, you know, and, and a little bit about his background. This was an, this was an, uh, an alim. So when he spoke to him, he asked the brother, you know, where did you learn tajweed? He said, I learned it in prison. Right? He learned, I learned it in prison. And he, the person was amazed at the type of work that is taking place behind bars. Brothers and sisters, you know, may Allah reward Sheikh Rami, the brothers and sisters that are part of the Quran Beheld Project, and everyone that is part of this project for taking this, uh, this, this project on and for making it in the name of our beloved uh, friend and brother, Sidi Mustafa, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, I, I thank everyone for the opportunity of me just having this, you know, token part of this program. I'm honored to be a part of it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan, Mawlana Kalsar. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And, uh, you know, you bring something that's um, definitely very unique to, to the conversation. In fact, everybody does. And that's what I love seeing about various speakers on a panel is that just like a prism, when the light goes through it, it's shining out in different ways. In the same way, Everybody has something different to share, and we need to have all of those voices. We really need to have it. And I've benefited immensely. I've, I came into this this session with with one understanding of Mustafa, and I'm going out with a completely different one because of the insights that I've gained from everybody here. And so, in closing, we know that some of you are watching this live. Some of you may be watching this re- recorded. And so, I encourage everyone to to help support the project of getting the Qur'an to the prison, wherever it might be. It's not just Taiba Foundation. It's not just Qur'an Beheld. There's many organizations working to really bring the Qur'an into the prisons. And this, you know, Mustafa's life and the, the discussions with Qur'an Beheld about this collaboration with Taiba reinvigorated that reminder to me that the Qur'an is the primary essential 
lesson that we need to deliver into the prison. Sayyid Tayyib and others mentioned about the, the curriculum that we've developed in Tayyibah over the years, which we have. We have extensive books in multiple levels in, in theology, in aqidah, in law, in fiqh, in multiple madahib, purification of the heart, hadith, Quranic sciences. And those are all methods of leading to the Quran. And at the same time, there's something that has to be said about just going back to the source itself. And this was a lesson that I learned in Ramadan in Mauritania when I would see, well, two things would happen. In Mauritania, it's a one-on-one -on -one education system where you go with the lesson that you've written on your loh, on your wooden board, to the teacher and you sit down and you wait for your lesson. It's going to be a one-on-one -on -one lesson with the sheikh. And so you're sitting with students who are li literally learning alif bata, some are learning inheritance, some are learning the, the finer points of balagha and grammar and nahu, usul, all of the various subjects. And you might sit and wait for an hour or two for your one-on-one -on -one lesson with the teacher. But whenever the students who are memorizing Quran walk into the setting, they get priority with the sheikh and everybody realizes this. It's natural. I could have been sitting there for an hour and a half waiting for my lesson. If a Quran student comes in, the sheikh will give priority to him. And it was funny because I saw this as the custom and I, I accepted it. There were some people who, who, had, who came from the West, who it bothered them. You know, uh, I just came back from Medina and, and Mecca. And, um, and one of the things that I, I, I remembered is that not everybody follows lines like we do in the West and the understanding of, of whose turn it is into following the line. And so some of the people who came to the Mahdara from the West, it kind of bothered them that why would I be sitting here for an hour and a half and this Quran student is able to, to jump to the front of the line. And so one day I was sitting there and I had waited a, quite a while and the Sheikh uh, Murabat Haddamin, Rahimullah, he saw me um, and then he just looked up at me and he said, Rami, I hope you're not bothered by this practice we have. I said, no, not at all. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala faddal al-Quran. He gave preference to the Quran, to his book. Shouldn't we give preference to the Quran? And and that's any any doubts or, uh, that I might have had about that culture, which I didn't have, alhamdulillah, at least I don't think I had, but that solidified for me. It gave me insight into why that was done. The other thing that Murabat Haddamin uh, told me is uh, the first Ramadan that I spent in, in, in Mauritania, he, he said, Rami, put down the study of fiqh. And the month of uh, Ramadan, focus on the Qur'an. And that's what the, the Mahdara there and other Mahdaras uh, focus on. They make the focus, if you're studying theology, you might be studying Nahu, Balagha, uh, Usul, whatever subject, you put it down and the focus becomes Qur'an. Qur'an memorization, Qur'an recitation, tafsir of the Qur'an, anything related to the Qur'an. And so what I feel in the development of Tayyibah, this is, a, this is a, a pivotal moment in the development of Tayyibah because for many years we've, been, we've, we, we've had those other subjects at the forefront and they're needed. You need to be able to know your aqidah, your fiqh, your tazkiyah, your, your purification of the heart so that you can access the Qur'an. But the, and there's also something to be said about just giving the source itself and helping people understand that even if they may not know the full fiqh of their prayer and purification, the power of the Qur'an is going to be much more powerful in terms of, of, of reaching them uh, than maybe a fiqh lesson would. And so it's not to degrade from those or to detract from those other, those other lessons, but that's what we're doing in Tlaiba internally to saying, okay, how can we now help ourselves reconnect with the Book of Allah, taking as an example Sidi Abdullah Mustafa, and also for our students now, help them re uh, reconnect with the Quran. And so, with with that, we 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 hope to um, we hope to get closer ourselves to the Book of Allah, and to help others as well to get close to the Book of Allah. The Quran be held project and the distri distribution that's already underway. As I said, the the Quran be held. They already have 500 donors who have sponsored their uh, copies of the Quran. Taiba is going to facilitate those going into the prison. We've already sent out about 2,000 letters to. Muslims in the in the prison to say who can receive them because there's sometimes book limitations there's sometimes people uh, move around and so we're gathering the list of sending out those um, those initial copies as well as the matched copies of that one anonymous donor who's going to continue as a sadaqa jariya on his behalf match every single uh, uh, purchase that is purchased for the prisoners he will match another one so all of those donors he's going to match so it's a it's a beautiful it's a wonderful way of spreading the book of Allah and I'll end on this. One of the things that I really, really was uh, taken 
by when I read about it in the, the history of the transatlantic slave trade or the, the theft of the, the, those free people from Africa and bringing them over and putting them into the bonds of, of, of chains, many of whom were Muslim. And they said, you know, the, the, the conditions in the, the ships were so, were so filthy and cramped and tight and just um, uh, horrendous and people dying and, and bodies being thrown over the ships, sharks following the ships because they knew that there was food to be, uh, uh, that all the time there's bodies going out. People ripped from their families, ripped from their clothes, ripped from their dignity. You can imagine the, the, the despair that people must have felt in the bellies of those slave ships. They said the one thing that gave consolation to all of the, the, the slaves, whether they were Muslim or Christian or animist or any other religion, um, or no religion, the one thing that would give them um, uh, solace or consoling their heart was the Qur'an reciters. That these men and women who had memorized the Qur'an, that when everything else was ripped from them, they could still recite the Qur'an from their heart. And in the, the bellies of those ships, in the darkness of the ocean, in the darkness of the night, the sound of the Qur'an reciters was able to bring some level of, of consolation and, and, and peace to the, 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 the prisoners and the slaves in, in, in those ships. And so I always think about that when I think about the prison, prisons in the United States and other places as well, that, that the Quran can bring solace in that same way to the Muslims and also to everybody who's, who's in the dungeons of those, um, uh, in, in, in those, in, in those conditions. Um, and um, there, one of our students, he signed his, his name, al Ardal. And I, I've never heard that, you know, like as a, he had his name and then he put Al Ardal. And so I wrote to him and I said, why did you call, why did you put Al Ardal? What does that mean? And he gave me the Quranic reference. And I looked it up and it's the story of Nuh alayhi salam when he's calling his people and his people are saying, why should we follow you? And only the lowest of the people are following you. That's, that's who you have to show. And so this brother in prison, he wrote. He he took on that 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 name. He said, "I'm al Ardal because that's who I am in prison. I'm one of those lowly people." Um, and so that gave me insight into a number of things. But one of them is that how how the Quran is alive for them. That that when 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 those brothers and sisters read those stories, they can actually relate on 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 a on a, on a level that maybe some of us in free society can't. When they read about the the jahiliya and the tribal systems, they can see that in the prison politics and the gang politics in the prisons. When they see the oppression of Fir'aun, they can see that in the system. So there is something very unique about their experience with the Qur'an. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst the people of the Qur'an, from amongst the people of the Ahlul Qur'an, and to be able to facilitate the Qur'an to the brothers and sisters who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. We thank everybody for joining us. Thank you so much for all of the, the panelists for sharing. And we look forward to this project continuing and being a sadaqa jariya, being an ongoing charity in the name of uh, Mustafa Abdullah Mustafa Rahimahullah to bring Qur'ans and Qur'anic resources to the incarcerated Muslims in the United States. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank uh you. -huh.